so in the polytunnel, <laughs> compared to the outdoor bed we saw, growth is much more advanced. And I can show you some aphids here on the tomato, for example, on this leaf I'm seeing quite a few. But I'm not worried about them because overall you look at these plants, they're strong and healthy. The colour's good. Uh, yeah, they, there's not an issue. And, and also looking up at the growing points, I'm not noticing any particular aphids in there. That, that can be an issue more. Uh, we could see that in the greenhouse in a minute on some aubergines actually, and I'll show you the difference there again. And one thing you can do with aphids though is to wash them off. If, if, you, if you have a, a problem, you know, if there's more than this, th this is not an infestation really, it's just a few, which is great actually, because it means there'll be a few ladybirds probably in here somewhere, just they've got a nice balance. Strong, healthy growth, generally speaking, you get less, fewer aphids. So, you, you know, if you've got a lot, you need to be looking at, is my soil good enough? Have I, have I mulched it enough? Um, no dig really helps. I had a very interesting email yesterday from a guy on an allotment site near here. And he said of the 20 allotments on his site <coughs> and all the other guys are cultivating, digging, rotivating, he's no dig. His broad beans are the only ones that don't have black fly. The only ones of the 20 sites. And he said they're much stronger, healthier looking and tasting fabulous. So really good uh, recommendation for no dig in a comment like that. And this is all no dig, so I think, you know, that it really helps soil health, plant health. Uh, one other thing happening here, though, is not related to soil or anything. It's temperature again, and that's this leaf roll. Not all varieties do it. You can see this one is sun gold, which is more tolerant of cool conditions and generally rolls its leaves rather less than uh, this one. You know, I'm afraid I can't remember its name. It's lost its label in the polytunnel move. But basically, this is not a terrible problem. If, if you see this, it's really common, tomatoes rolling their leaves. It's not a shortage of water. These have all had the same amount of water. You know, the, this one is not rolling right next to that one, which is, it's, it's a varietal trait. Again, some varieties do it more than others, and it's to do with night and day temperature differences. So I've got a thermometer over there. It's very interesting. It actually gets pretty cool in here at night. Lately, it's been getting colder in here than outside colder in the polytunnel than outside. <laughs> Just repeating that because it sounds so odd. At night, because there's no movement of air. And so you, you know how you get colder nights, frost and everything when the air is still and not warmer air from above is not getting mixed with cold air below. So that's going on a bit, particularly in, you know, polythene doesn't really hold heat. It warms up rapidly when the sun's out. It holds in the, some of the infrared warmth, but at night that's not happening anymore. So the heat just goes out. Whereas my greenhouse is very interesting comparison that's roughly three centigrade, seven Fahrenheit, uh, five Fahrenheit warmer in the greenhouse. And we can see the difference in there with no leaf roll or very little and the aubergines too. I'm always learning a lot in my garden because I'm growing a lot of plants of the same plants in different conditions. So for example, these aubergines, <laughs> they're the same planting, sowing date and planting time as the ones outside. Oh, sorry, they were, so, they were planted a little bit earlier, but basically they looked very similar and, and the timing is not much different. Yet you can see how much bigger they are compared to the outdoor ones from being in this greenhouse where it's quite a bit warmer. And on that note also, the tomatoes are not showing much leaf roll because the nights in here particularly are about three centigrade warmer than in the polytunnel. The glass and the wood just hold a bit more warmth. So one is learning all the time from these small differences. And also it's fascinating and slightly worrying to see how many aphids there are on the aubergines because yeah, they really are actually quite covered in places. And yet I'm not as worried as maybe I might be because actually I'm looking at these aubergines and they look really strong and healthy. And that, that matters, you know, if, if, you, if, if they were all yellow and wizened or whatever it might be. Um, there'd be more cause for concern. And I know that the aphid predators as, uh, at this time of year are getting more and more numerous and will, I'm sure, from past experience, sort that out soon and get more of a balance. And it's not to say there won't ever be no aphids because there's got to be some, otherwise your predators also disappear. So just at the moment, we've got a, a preponderance of aphids and I'm going to water them again later. 
um, to scatter some of these sofas just onto the ground and just put a bit of a, slow them down a bit, basically. <laughs> um, and we'll finish this talking about pests by looking at some leaf miner and sparrows on beetroot leaves. Beetroot have really suffered this spring particularly from leaf miner. And it's a pest that, an insect that lays its eggs in between the two skins of a leaf and hollows them out and the leaves end up looking really revolting and maybe this one here is a, a good demonstration of it. You get that yellowing then browning of a, a whole patch and um, sometimes you can sort of take this apart and find a little crawling maggoty thing in there. I'm, I'm not seeing one this time but they're clearly here a lot because so many of these leaves are affected and yet there are so many good leaves. And this is a nice illustration of how even in a year when sometimes you get a bad pest attack of whatever it might be, if your basic soil is good and healthy and strong and you've planted something at the right time. So these beetroot were sown late February in the greenhouse, planted here late March, fleece over. And look at that lovely clump of four strong beetroots to harvest. So that's despite some pest attack. And it's one part of the whole thing that pests are always going to be with us. Um, if we can get our plants growing strongly, that really helps in it just knowing what it is and whether you need to react to that. I would say on the whole with leaf miner, on, certainly on this level of damage I'm seeing here and corresponding growth though of the beetroot, I, I haven't worried about it. Um, I'd rather not see it, but it's not taking away from the harvest. <clears throat> What's also going on here, and which can take away from the harvest when the beetroots are small, is sparrows pecking on the leaves. <laughs> There's some of them up there just watching as, as we're filming and we, we, it's just a, a small bird problem but not major it's not as bad as pigeons sometimes in the winter but if you if I'd sown the beetroot here and they were coming up as seedlings the sparrows just pecking on leaf margins like this where they they chip away around the edge sometimes take out a hole in the middle and when the seedling is small that that can wipe them out and that's a, a, a reason for transplanting beetroot and, and even using a bit of mesh or fleece just to get, help them get going. Once they're bigger, they can put up with this amount of damage. And sparrows will do this here also to chard, which is a bit more problem, for, certainly for me, if, if I want to sell it, because it doesn't look very nice. Uh, so in that case, we'd put a bird netting over that. That is an option always to stop birds eating your plants. And finally, in this, catalogue of horrors, uh, we'll look at one or two diseases, uh, starting with potatoes. So here we have some lovely Charlotte, second early potatoes, popped in the ground seed potato second week of April. It's actually also a trial bed in many ways, it's um, fifth year in a row of potatoes growing here in the same place and until now they've all been fine. Suddenly, just last week, I noticed this going on, which is black leg. And from what I've managed to find out, it's actually something that comes in on a seed potato. So it's, it's a useful thing, I think, for you to know about, because if you get it, maybe complain to your seed supplier, or at least let them know. I don't think it's come from the soil, even though as it happens, I haven't been doing rotation here, but what I won't do is grow potatoes here next year. <laughs> there won't be a sixth year because this bacteria that's causing this blackening of the stem, it's one of the few bacterial diseases as opposed to fungal. And it persists in the soil for quite a little while, like years. So uh, just to see what's going on, I thought it'd be interesting. I'm gonna harvest these. There might be some edible potatoes here. Uh, mainly by pulling on a little bit of lever because the stems have got weakened by the bacteria and yeah you can see that there is a harvest these will be good to eat by the way but I'm disposing of this lot uh, without spreading the infected leaves too much and everything because 
apparently it is pretty infectious. I don't think that's just old age, I think, on these ones. I'm not seeing any of that black on any of the other stems, but it is mostly the stems that get it. And I rather got rid of that a bit too fast, maybe to show you, but there, you, it's, you know, it really is black, actually. That kind of blackness of a stem. If you see anything like that on your potatoes, it's very pronounced. This is not just going yellow and, you know, normal old age. And it's quite sudden as well. A, it, the plant looked healthy and then suddenly it's not. But having said all of that, at least it's not total disaster. There is a harvest of Charlotte second early potatoes here. This is no dig, so they're growing, the actual tubers are growing mostly in the compost on the surface. And you can see how I mostly pulled them out. I didn't need to um, I just leave it a bit with a trowel. What caught my eye just there actually was the old seed potato. And if I, what I would like to do is not leave too much residue here of anything affected by these bacteria. Probably, I'm going to keep an eye on these neighbouring plants now. Um, normally we'd harvest these not for another two weeks or so, but if, if I see it spreading, we'll probably harvest the whole bed just to be on the safe side, because I don't want it to build up in the soil here. The other thing, of course, that affects potatoes some years at this time of year, this is late June, and it's suddenly warming up. And if we get rain, like a couple of days of rain and continual damp and high humidity, with the temperatures now, which are consistently over 10 centigrade, 50 Fahrenheit, that's when you can get blight. We've had that level of humidity, dampness and rain last week and the week before, but it wasn't warm enough. The nighttime temperatures have been quite low, often between five and eight centigrade, the 40s Fahrenheit. So we've been okay for blight so far, but it won't be long. I haven't got any blight to show you here, and I know people worry about it, I think, too much really. It's, you know, this is not blight. That's just old age yellowing of leaves, for example. Spots on leaves, that's a common one. Yeah, here we go. That is not blight. <laughs> so, yeah, no worries, I don't know exactly what causes odd spots like that or a little hole. Uh, blight is much more dramatic. It, what you see is a suddenly, rapidly enlarging, almost translucent browning of the leaves. They go limp and then before long the whole plant looks miserable, leaves die. If the weather stays favourable to it, humid and warm, you, you know, within a week you, the whole lot here could go brown. Sometimes it starts and then the weather dries up and it stops and you can take off some leaves and you might then be okay. But often it's it's a bit terminal when you get blight, but I'm not emphatically not seeing any of it here. So do it, do, I'll put up a photo to go with this video of blight that you'll see, and, and that will help you to recognize it. It's, it is really worth doing a bit of research on some of these possible problems so that you know what for sure what you're looking for, not just guessing. And we'll finish with a, a little look at some onions and one or two things that are going on with them because they also um, can be a problem. This, by the way, I'm not going to compost. It's one of the few things that I'm going to um, send to recycling, which will be fine because they get their heat so hot, like 80 centigrade, they kill everything actually. But uh, this black leg won't survive that. So it at least turn into organic matter. So there's some different plantings of onions here for different purposes, partly and it's interesting to see how they're growing and what we can learn from them. For example, these are white Lisbon, that's a variety of onion, which I sowed in modules last September, early September, and planted here last October, early October. And they're overwintering as small plants, and then they produce spring onions, which basically are salad, uh, immature onions, if you like, and you harvest them when they're still not bulbed and lots of green. But if you leave them, even spring onions, in inverted commas, turn into onions, in inverted commas. It's like, you know, they're all onions in the end. But one or two of them here are doing things like bolting. And that's um, from them being sown really quite early in terms of 
what the onion is thinking of to do and make seeds. Um, it's been through the winter, but there's not many of them bolting here, but they will bolt if they're sown too early. If you, you'll get bolting happen with um, onions from seed or particularly from sets if you sow them too early. If you plant too early, if you plant sets before, I always reckon here about the middle of March and there's more likelihood to be bolting of onions. Um, and then with the bolting, like here's one that's bolting and I took out the head. Um, but it's, it's, they're amazing things onions and how it's sort of divided and it's making now a, a separate onion in there. So that's the, um, the bolting head which is got pretty tough and hollow and you wouldn't really want to eat that but there is actually still some onion here that you can eat and um, you know although it started life as a spring onion if you like they're turning into quite nice bulb onions uh, but some of them are sort of doing this slightly rotting thing that they do and I'm not too sure what it is actually I mean it's, this is still a nice onion but it's the leaves are starting to go yellow quite a bit um, but having said that you know once you've trimmed them off it doesn't always, it's not like the black leg we just saw on the potatoes where it's a disaster. Oh, actually, having said that, this one is rotting right through, but this is not white rot. If this was white rot, <coughs> which is a horrible fungal disease, fungal, not bacterial, of onions, it would not have healthy roots like that. When you get white rot, you see the leaves all going bright yellow quite quickly, and then the plant just falls over, because if you pull it, it's kind of got any roots anymore. It's a fungus that eats the roots, basically. So you don't want that. If you get that in your soil, often from onion sets, it must be said, and which is again, another reason why I prefer growing onions from seed. Um, if, if you do get white rot, then I go no dig, because that means you don't spread it around in any kind of cultivation. So that helps. And, and people who've got it have been saying, and I've had it once, usually within four years, your soil can be clear of it so it's not the end of the world but you don't grow onions leeks or garlic for around four years it can come in also on garlic um, seed I'm afraid just occasionally so it's something to be aware of you know you can keep your own garlic to grow again if you want to and I'll, I'll just finish by mentioning a lovely healthy crop here which is onions sown um, early March this year multi sown in modules planted early April these are red onions or they will be um, bulb onions I mean, these, again, you could pull for spring onions, you know, like that. Onions are all quite similar, but these ones have been bred to make nice bulbs as well. So I'm aiming for four or five in a clump. Sometimes if I see them thicker than that, I will pull out the little ones to use as spring onions. Um, but that's generally healthy, and that's telling me the soil is good and I'm not needing to worry too much. You know, the, this incident here of a little bit of rotting is we've, we've already picked from this patch <coughs> um, nearly a hundred spring onions. So they've done really well. This has been a mostly good story. And I, I hope that this video hasn't worried you too much. What I've been showing is, is helping to help you identify some of the problems. And I wish you happy gardening and general health and well-being, but there are always some issues. So just bear them in mind and react if you need to but often you don't need to you just need to know a bit and, and deal with the problem when you see it very quickly 